Where I left off exactly, you said you were going to keep me on the straight and narrow here. We were, Jesus was approaching Jerusalem, and uh, you guys recall where we were? Come on, you know. back, we were no, 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 I was talking about something on Thursday. Where, where, where were we? What was it? I said, remind me. You were in Matthew 24. Okay, what? 24, Matthew 24. 151, the little Okay, apocalypse. okay, the little apocalypse. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Oh, I just came to something because I'm looking at this... Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, you can go through every sentence and find these things. Um, by the way, here we have the poor widow, Mark 12, 41, preceding this. Um, throwing her, uh, uh, casting her two mites into the temple and so on and so forth. Um, and later on, I'm going to get... Judas Iscariot casting his bribe money into the temple treasury and so on. So we get variations on themes going all the time. But here's one that I think is particularly, uh, uh, particularly uh, um, interesting, I think. And the John 12, which I have preceding these little apocalypses from John, maybe you know from yours, 42. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, lest they be put out of the synagogues. I mean, that is preposterous. I, I'm sorry to be cruel. That again shows the origin. Playing up to the ruling class, playing up to the ruling class, the Pharisees as a code name for the people observing the law within the church, the James party, according to Acts. Also implying, uh, John knows that later on there was a ban on sex in the synagogue. That came in the, uh, in the second century. Uh, it's called the Birkat Minim. Uh, that's a much later situation and so on. All this um, belies a much later provenance, as we say. Now, you know, you're going to get angry at me because I'm... Uh, and then we have, um, I am come as a light unto the world. And, uh, Etc. 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 All the Neoplatonic uh, philosophy of, uh, of of light philosophy from Alexandria. What's so sex in a synagogue? Huh? Sex. S C C T S. Um, the, the, after all the trouble began in the second century, there became a, a, a yeah. I know you're jerking me there, but the, <laughs> good one. Okay, look, uh, I gotta get, I gotta move along here. So anyway, the little apocalypses: Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. It starts off with the last shall not left be one stand, one stone upon stone. Most scholars think that is written after the fall of the temple. I agree with them. Other than that, you have um, a pair of 40 years prior to the temple, this being predicted, possibly. But um, most think that uh, that, that be token. And after the fall of the temple from beyond, you say, well, solid scholars are cynical. Yeah, well, we've already discussed that. Uh, I'm rushing along here because we don't go through the same same thing so over and over again. Either you think scholars have a, some point, or the more critical scholars have a point there, or you think that this is the historical Jesus. And there's only no way to prove it either way, only your determination. You have to make the judgment call. Then um, it, we have him on the Mount of Olives, and he speaks of a sign again. And again, don't forget the miracle workers making signs in Josephus. Very, um, very. Uh, he says they're more dangerous even than the uh, than the uh, brigands and the thugs and the re revolutionaries. He says that uh, uh, um, uh, often. Uh, Matthew twenty four four. Now this these whole sections are called the little apocalypses when Jesus looks out at the temple and predicts the future. Um, leading astray, very big usage in the, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And someone came and led the many astray and removed the boundary markers and so on and so forth. It's repeated over and over again in the Damascus document. 
leading many astray even more to the point of the Damascus document. Many is the uh, usage that is used in the Damascus document for the, for, the, uh, for the rank and file. You might have multitudes there, but um, you know, I think the Greek probably is more like many, but in any case, um, that's a, now we wouldn't have known this before we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, so why didn't people in 1000 AD understand this? Oh, because they didn't have some things like the scrolls to work on. We're a fortunate generation. We have contemporary uh, documents from first century period, BC or AD, whatever you think they're from, from Palestine as I've, um, as I've explained. Okay, now um, the end, the end time, Daniel. That's a, a concept in Daniel. It's also um, very strong in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Kingdoms rising against kingdoms, famines, uh, you shall be hated uh, for, by all peoples for my name. Many will come and stumble. And then again, false prophets shall arise, many leading many astray. Again, reflecting language that we have from other sources, but perhaps this is what he said. That's up to you to determine. It looks a lot like the uh, you know early first centuries of Christianity there, with the idea that um, you know many will come in my name and so on, false prophets, etc., 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 etc. But again, that's a matter of taste. Uh, this all comes down to, to they will deliver you up to councils and in synagogues you shall be beaten. That shows uh, the picture of Paul in Acts, uh, where he's supposedly being beaten uh, in Asia Minor. I don't think many people were being beaten in synagogues. I never saw anyone beaten in a synagogue, but um, uh, um, perhaps uh, such a thing occurred. And you will stand before governors again. This sounds, um, you know, again, it's supposed to be predicted. So you'll have to judge this, it's called Little Apocalypse. Uh, and uh, 15, when you see the abomination of the desolation, standing where it ought not to stand, and uh, that, of course, even Matthew uh, notes to you that that's from the prophet Daniel. Um, and many think it's the, um, referring to the, um, Romans sacrificing to their standards on the Temple Mount, but it's also in the Maccabee books, it's the statue of the Olympian Zeus that um, the Seleucids set up in the temple at the time of the Maccabean uprising in 170 to 60 BC. Anyway, those that are in Judea should flee to the mountains, like a final apocalyptic flood, if you want to call, call that. Um, Children, Matthew 13, 12, add, shall rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Uh, but the main thing here is like in Luke 21, 20. When you see Jerusalem encompassed by armies, then you shall know that the desolation is at hand and let them flee to the mountains. So Jerusalem encompassed by armies is the coming of the Romans, clearly, to take Jerusalem. Again, it depends on how you see things. If you think that this is real speech, then it's predictive. If you think it's retrospective, people who already know about um, the Romans coming, then it's retrospective. So um, uh, that's one of the main quotes here that is um, used to show this as retrospective. Again, I, I, um, I, I, can't, I can't be, these are some favorite passages uh, for you, but we can't dwell on them too much. I want to run along here. I'm just picking out what's interesting. The star shall fall, 929 of Matthew, 24 of Mark, 26 of uh, Luke. Um, the reason I always say these things are retrospective is the people are getting it wrong. And I may be nuts. And you may um, have you know, 
a reason to explain this. But the Son of Man is not a prophetical notation. So the Son of Man is, shows someone who doesn't understand the scripture but is reading it in a, perhaps a foreign language or getting it orally, reading it in Greek or Latin or something like that. Uh, Daniel doesn't ever speak of the Son of Man. He speaks of one like a Son of Man. That is one who looked like a man but was actually not a man, more than a man. And um, when Ezekiel uses the Son of Man, he's speaking to himself. Son of Man, prophesy unto the nations. Son of Man, tell them that God is angry, blah, 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 blah. How many have read the prophet Ezekiel? It's all through Ezekiel, but particularly from around chapter 35 onwards. You can read Ezekiel, it's very inspiring, but he's addressing himself, the prophet. Son of Man, speak, and he means by that, Man, you know, in Hebrew, Ben Adam, son of Adam. Adam and man are the same thing. Adam and man are the same thing in Hebrew. And, uh, you know, son of Adam means you're a human being. So you're not the son of man, you're a son of man. So there's, no, there's just no son of man predicted in the prophets. It just doesn't exist. So the whole material about the Son of Man is, uh, is um, inaccurate. I know, I'm sorry uh, to be the harbinger, so I know it's so, so, so uh, um, well-known and uh, widespread. Now, you will see the Son of Man coming cloud with power and great glory. Okay. That is a speech predicated of James in early church testimony in Hegesippus from the second century. Hegesippus died, I think, around 180 AD. And he says that James, when he's about to, to uh, be killed, stood on the um, pinnacle of the temple or the steps of the temple or something and spoke about seeing the Son of Man and so on and so forth may or may not be an accurate speech, but the point is those are the kind of things that are being predicated of these, uh, of these teachers in this movement. But it's even more uh, pronounced in the War Scroll from the Dead Sea Scroll. If you've uh, read the War Scroll, I think a lot of you have, the War of the Sons of Light Against Sons of Darkness, if you look in column 10, 11, and 18, and 19, it speaks of the star prophecy. that will come from uh, Jacob, a scepter, a star to rule the world. Something to that effect is from Numbers 24, 17. It's supposed to be the messianic prophecy. It quotes it in, um, completely in the war scroll. And then it goes on to what looks like uh, uh, expound that prophecy. And it said, it then picks up something I think from Isaiah, and by the sword of no mere man, and by the sword of no mere man, no mere Adam. Something more than a man, that's another uh, prophetical statement woven into the fabric of the war scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls. He will lead the poor, and, uh, the, and the heavenly host, and the myriads of angels, and heavenly holy ones. I quoted in the uh, preface to my, uh, the dedication preface to my New Testament code, because I think it's so important. Anyway, it pictures uh, this no mere man leading the heavenly host on the clouds to render judgment on all that grows on earth. But it doesn't picture the Son of Man. It pictures the Messianic, uh, or maybe God himself, it's not clear which, with all his angels uh, coming on, and the angels and the heaven hosts are pictured like clouds, shedding judgment like a torrent of rain. Now, I think this is picking up from that. 
that is the whole imagery of a flood, of a torrent of rain, and so on. Second apocalyptic flood, if you want to call it that. So what I um, what I encourage you to look at, take a look at the war scroll. You'll see the, this whole imagery of this um, coming of the heavenly hosts on the clouds of glory, or whatever you want to call it. It's put in much more compressed language here, and 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 so on. By the way, um, he speaks about heaven and earth not passing away, but my, uh, uh, heaven and earth passing away, but my words never passing away. Earlier, I think, how did he put it, or how is he pictured as putting it, depending on how you see it? I think in Matthew it says something like, um, in terms of watch the heaven and earth things, um, I think it says, uh, not one jit, jot or tittle shall pass away from the law until all these things are accomplished, I think he says. So it's a, it, it's a similar sort of uh, a reference to all these things being accomplished. And um, in the Gospel of Thomas, which was found at Nag Hammadi in the name of Judas Thomas, the Judas the twin, in the appointment um, logo, or logion as it's called, Gospel of Thomas is not a story, it's a series of sayings. There's an appointment logion of James. In the place where you are to go, go to James the just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into existence. Uh, so all those, I think, make a circle of usage that you should look at. Again, I'm, I'm not able to give you a final judgment on the um, authenticity or non-authenticity of things of this kind. You have to decide that. Um, okay, Matthew 24 continues where the others kind of leave off in Matthew 25. They continue into, um, I think everything ends in this little apocalypse sort of um, around... Um, Luke uh, 34, and uh, Matthew kind of ends uh, around 24, 44. Mark ends around 13, 37. Notice, by the way, still in Matthew, which is more detailed, he explains this image more. As it were in the days of Noah, so shall it be with the coming of the Son of Man. So it is actually pictured as a second flood, or a second flood-like apocalyptic episode. But my only problem there with uh, these things, aside from seeing Jerusalem circled by armies and so on and so forth, and the abomination standing where it ought not to stand, used in previous materials in the Maccabean books and so on, is um, the problem of the Son of Man which is just replete throughout the Gospels and so on. And the, the Son of Man is, um, is really man. In other words, not Son of God. In any event, Son of Adam, not a supernatural heavenly being, which we all are supposed to be. Sons of man, daughters of, 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 of Adam. Now there may have been a special meaning for which may have related it to the primal Adam. Now, I've spoken to you about the primal Adam, but the primal Adam is known as an ornament of what they call Jewish Christianity, the um, <coughs> pseudo-Clementines, recognitions, homilies, and it's a doctrine of a sort of pre-existent being that is called the primal Adam, the first Adam. Uh, Paul knows about it in 1 Corinthians. I'll read it to you in a second. Uh, and I told you about it. It's a supernatural being like the Islamic Imam that comes in and out of people and puts on different bodies and shapes. A perfect being. Also called the standing one 
because I suppose it has something to do with being resurrected or something to that effect. Anyway, it keeps on moving through history and time, and it's, an, it, it, it's a sort of incarnationist doctrine. Sort of like the Word made flesh in the Gospel of John. So if, in fact, the Son of Man is a kind of variation on the primal Adam, then I can understand it a little bit more, if that's what it's supposed to mean by some people who were trying to put this into a different Greek form. But I'll just read you Paul, then I'll quit on this subject. To show you that, not that Paul knows the Son of Man. He don't, I don't know if he uh, ever speaks of the Son of Man. I may be wrong. But look at Paul. 1 Corinthians 15.42, or 15.40s, 15, 15, anyway. He's talking about the sun and the glory of the moon and the stars, the natural body, 44, the spiritual body, his usual um, juxtaposition of spirit and body. Notice, by the way, even earlier, when he, he talks earlier in 15 about the different appearances, I suppose first to, uh, first to James, then all the apostles, and then the other one, first to Cephas, then to the twelve, and we've discussed that previously. That's in line 5 of chapter 15. He admits to persecuting the early church, no, I always go back a bit to see the context of these things. Um, it says in 14, if uh, Christ was not raised, then our preaching is worthless. Your faith is worthless. <coughs> he preaches the risen Christ. And then in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Habakkuk commentary, the spouter of lying is said to... Um, preach a doctrine full of lies and his uh, saving, his amal it's called, the saving works are worthless. And the actual word used is worthless, that he teaches worthlessness. So that's another possible connection. You can't prove any of these things, but they mount up in the sheer number. Then he says in 21 here, for all die in Adam shall be made alive in Christ. Again, he starts the Adam situation. And he goes on after a long uh, excursion there to line 45. And it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. So the first man, Adam, the primal Adam, the first man, the primal Adam, Adam. So you see, he knows about the primal Adam, I think. Now, he may, I may be wrong, but I do think he knows that doctor is already circulating. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. That's our, our Adam, our Jesus, that he calls the last Adam. So he knows Jesus as Adam, if you follow me. So I'm just trying to show you how the Son of Man may have started becoming good instead of like a man. Uh, so... The first man, and there he actually says it, the primal Adam, the first man, line 47, you see all these things? Is earthly, physical. The second man, let me see if my Greek here, that's why I always go to Greek. Yeah, you see, I don't see in Greek, I think, Adam and man are different words. In Hebrew, they're not. So in any case, if they don't pick up the Hebrew uh, identity there of Adam and man because Adam is a name in Greek and man is a, is a different word in in, in um, Greek anthropos um, so the first man of the earth earth the second man is the Lord out of heaven there it is that he comes out of heaven on the clouds you know and so on and so forth so Jesus is the Lord out of heaven then he goes on to explain the, the, what kind of life you're going to get I guess uh, after the, you know, after the resurrection or after the present world passes away. And this is a favorite passage in Paul. 
So let me tell you a heavenly secret. We shall not all die. And I've said that a lot in the Damascus document from the Dead Sea Scrolls, where it defines who the sons of uh, of Adam, uh, sons of Zadok are, sons of Zadok on column four, Z sons of Zadok coming from these passages in Ezekiel at the end of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel pictures the reconstructed temple and the sons of Zadok, Zadok being the uh, high priest in David's temple, the first high priest of the first temple. How will the sons of Zadok are going to be, and it says, and they shall stand, there's the standing one, but it's plural here in the Damascus document, column four. And um, they show uh, the sons of Zadok are the first men of, hol of holiness or something like that. It's, the text is broken there. Who shall stand or go on standing in the last days. And so what I've tried to point out in that is stand can also mean go on functioning or can also be resurrected in Hebrew. Ezekiel, the bones passage also from that, those uh, final chapters of Ezekiel, and the bones are pictured as standing up, standing up from the earth. By the way, bones don't just stand up in the normal way, they stand up a vast and immense army in Ezekiel. You know, I always, um, you, 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 you might um, laugh, and I, you know, I may have told you this, when I was young, we used to say prayer in classes in all the high school, or in all the grad, grad, grade schools, grammar schools, that was normal, and we said the Lord's Prayer, and so on and so forth, and, and then uh, we would also usually read a psalm or something, and usually a lot of, we would choose what psalm we would choose to read, uh, the students, and one of the favorite psalms was Psalm uh, 24, I, by the way, I think that was healthy, even though it may have had some religious overtones that some people disagreed with, but it certainly gave people a, a certain moral compass that is, as we now know, totally lacking in the education and the fabric of the, of the school. And it isn't good enough to teach comparative religions in place of that. It's nice to inspire young people or something. Anyway, um, this Psalm 24, which we would know, and we, of course, another favorite was Psalm 23, Make me lie down in the pastures, leaves me inside still water, he restores my soul, and so on and so forth. Leaves me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. So I just still recite it to you. It's a beautiful song. But 24 was lift up your gates, so lift up your heads, or your gates, and be lifted up the everlasting wars, and the King of Glory shall come in. And it goes on like that, and it says, Who is the King of Glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of Glory. If you're familiar with the Psalms, how many have heard that song? third of you have. If you had lived in my day, all of you would have. Um, you see, I can still recite it, but it's just like rote that of my brain. They said it so often in the classes. Uh, so being young and very uh, childlike uh, at that time, to me, the Lord of Hosts, I said, oh, yeah, the Lord of Hosts. You know, he would sit down at the table, and I'd get it all confused in my brain, and I thought it meant a, a person who was being a good host. I didn't realize the Lord of people who are, you know, receive people in their houses and have a good, uh, a good um, welcoming atmosphere of host. I didn't realize it actually meant the Lord of armies. I didn't even realize it meant the heavenly hosts. That is, the heavenly army. Any that Ezekiel speaks of uh, standing up a vast and immense army, Sava in Hebrew, and Sava even in modern Hebrew, if you know the name of Israel uh, defense forces, they're called Zahal. And Zahal is an acronym, Z-A-H-A-L, for Sva Army, uh, shortened like his name, Sva Haganal Israel. The army of the defense, you know, the, the defense forces for the state of Israel, the the uh, Tzvahagadah Israel. So even in Israel, the army is still called the Tzavah. <laughs> so just what you'd like to know. I thought it meant someone who gave people a good dinner. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure a lot of people may have made that. Anyway, so he's the lowest. Second man is. I'm going to tell you a heavenly secret. And the point of that section in the Damascus document is that I think 
it was clear from the Damascus document that the righteous dead will have to enjoy whatever is being predicated. But the righteous living are not all going to have to die first before they go into the kingdom. You see what I mean? And of course, I think modern Christians uh, understand that in their idea of the rapture, which is so popular, that you know the living are going to get rapturized too, if you want to call it that. I don't know if they had an idea of the rapture back in those days. But you see, you have two classes of people in the Damascus doctrine. You have the righteous predecessors who are going to, you know, according to the Maccabee books, you know, the righteous will be resurrected. The others don't go to hell like we see it now, which, you know, brings in Greek, Greco-Roman concepts of Hades and so on, and also brings in some Egyptian ideas, etc., etc. But for the Maccabee book, 2nd century B.C., particularly Maccabees 2, the righteous are resurrected and the, and the, and the others just stay dead. That's, that's, that's the way it is. The righteous are resurrected. The others don't go on to some weird world where people are rolling stones and boiling them up and, you know, uh, you know <laughs> some mythological, uh, uh, you know, maniacal, um, what's his name, uh, Mel Gibson sort of world. I heard that he's got this new book called Apocalyptios, which uh, this new movie Apocalyptios, which is well executed. They wonder, well, what's going to happen? And so, well, actually, aren't they going to nominate him for an Academy Award? <laughs> well, the problem is that it's so sadistical of people ripping out hearts and eating things and the bloodthirsty from violence from one end to the other uh, that I think people could, uh, with all uh, with all due conscience, not nominate him. So one, one reviewer has said, uh, yeah, he, he's a good movie maker, but he's a, he's a sadist. <laughs> you know, it's a sadistic. Uh, I mean, the violence is so extreme and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, so, uh, and he's, his answer is, yeah, well, that's how I see the universe. It's one in place. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, let's not try to improve it, folks. Let's just uh, encourage it to, to the nth degree. Get all the gang members in there to the movie. Get all the gang bangers in there and uh, you know, encourage them to do worse. Uh, it's not my view of the universe anyway. Uh, all this sadistic violence, uh, horror, sort of uh, portrayal of uh, you know, thugism and so on. In any event, uh, even though you do it well, if you do do it well, I don't know. Uh, but the point being, uh, I don't think that that hell that we were speaking about that was portrayed to frighten people like that. You know, it's nice for the imagination, but as I said, the original Palestinian doctrine, and there is an Egyptian doctrine of this too, but the Palestinian view, I think, was more, uh, you know, the righteous are resurrected and the evil stay dead. That's the way it was. So in this Damascus document, you know, there's no picture of hell or anything like that. They do speak of the pit, but I'm not sure what they mean by the pit. They call the sons of the pit are the evil ones. Or maybe there was some pit idea that they had. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, so here was Paul's view of it. Be a trumpet blown. That's the Rosh Hashanah trumpet uh, 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 of the Jews on, uh, on the, the, you know, if you know how they blow the shofar. According to the Jews, uh, the seventh month with the so-called the New Year, which is not the New Year, but the seventh month, is celebrates the resurrection of the dead, and they usher it in with a trumpet call, if you want to call it that. Paul, I think, is reflecting that. Uh, he knows that idea of the trumpet, etc., to bring upon the resurrection. And Muhammad, of course, has this all through the Quran, the trumpet blowing that he gets from these documents, like, you know, the Old Testament, um, the prophets, uh, however we, was regurgitated to him. Certainly not through a holy angel, my friends. I don't mind what the Muslims want us to believe, but uh, I don't think anyone dictated anything to him. He did some good studying. In any case, also from Paul here. But the last days, the, the, the uh, last uh, judgment, and so the victim of the Quran usually is ushered in by a trumpet to it gets it from this imagery here. It goes back long before him. And the dead will be raised forever pure, and we shall be changed. Uh, and then he goes into the victory idea. Uh, death swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your sting? And it's the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
57, uh, and um, knowing your labor is not without fruit in the Lord. If you look at the passage about the death of James and the early church fathers, they say, uh, they apply the, a, a passage from Habakkuk, from Habakkuk, and they shall be um, something to do, and they shall have the fruit of their works given unto them. I think there's a, 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 a play with that going on here. So Paul is very familiar with these things. In any case, um, I think that's uh, uh, just to show about the first and last Adam in Paul and the resurrection which he goes on to talk about. I'm not trying to talk about the resurrection here. But I read that the first and last Adam. The second man is the Lord out of heaven. Okay, but he's not the son of man. He's the Lord out of heaven. In Paul's view. I don't think he has the uh, the son of man. I may be wrong, but um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I'm often wrong. Okay, Matthew goes on to give uh, some of his business um, uh, uh, parables in, in chapter 25 and um, I think I don't have time to go into um, the meaning and so on and so forth because it take me too long but uh, notice at the end of it 46 25 46 we have this doctrine of, of heaven and hell that we spoke about uh, the evil go to eternal punishment, the righteous to eternal life. In, in Matthew. In any case, uh, Luke 21, 37, and every day he was teaching in the temple. Uh, I think that's after overturning the money tables. And I don't know uh, the, how many days he was in the temple teaching. But the scholars have portrayed that to have done those things, as I told you, you would have had to have a takeover of the temple. Now, again, I can't, I'll just give you the possibilities there. The best scholar on that subject is S.G.F. Brandon. Jesus and the Zealots. Or one book called Jesus and the Zealots. And another book uh, called um, The Fall of Jerusalem in the Early Christian Church. Those are two really excellent books, and um, I recommend them hardly if you want to wrestle with the subjects of the takeover of the temple and Jesus' situation with the Zealots. Brandon didn't know the Dead Sea Scrolls particularly, and actually he got killed in the Egyptian desert. He was a, he was a British minister who taught at the University of Manchester. He read Robert Eisler, whose book, The Messiah, Jesus, and John the Baptist, I told you about. Uh, who also didn't know the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, he, he regurgitates Robert Eisler in English. And um, he was uh, in the British campaign in North Africa as a chaplain, uh, Battle of El Alamein and those places, then went on to become a PhD, etc. when he got out of the army, taught at the University of Manchester, and was in Upper Egypt, or, I guess it's not too far up the Nile, but in any case, when the Nag Hammadi things came in, he went out there to look at the sites there. Uh, I guess would, this would be around the mid 50s or late 50s. And uh, he got an acute attack of appendicitis before he got into the hospital and died. So uh, that was a sad story about that particular individual. Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22. The Passovers were coming. The Son of Man is to be delivered, delivered. After he finished these things, Jesus says that the Son of Man is to be delivered to be crucified. Um, Mark, Feast of the Unleavened Bread. He knows a little more about it, I guess, than Matthew there. Is coming. Luke just has the Passover. And um, the scribes are seeking to put him to death. In Mark, it's the chief priests and the scribes. Because they were afraid of the people, uh, Luke adds. Uh, that picks up perhaps with the one man should die rather than the whole people be destroyed. But again, the popularity of Jesus 
belies some of these ideas that the rulers accepted him or the uh, tax collectors uh, wanted to be with him or the Roman centurions liked him but the people gnashed their teeth at him. You follow me? So, you know, it just it swings back and forth on those issues. You could write a long paper on that subject, on the, the swinging back and forth between these various opponents and supporters and how they keep shifting shapes, if you want to call it. I don't have time to do that, but I call your attention to it, because I have to hurry. And, okay, so Caiaphas is the high priest at that time, according to Matthew, line 3. These ideas, tumults, line 5, is Josephus says in the Antiquities, in the reign of Pontius Pilate, I think he says there were five tumults. That's the language he uses. Mark also uses the tumult language in line 9. Of but he leaves out the Jesus tumult somehow. Although he does actually include it in the Antiquities, in the war he leaves it out. Uh, you should look at the tumults. Uh, again, Robert Eisler is very good for that sort of thing. I mean, he goes through all that stuff in great detail inside Jesus and John the Baptist. Anyway, one of the twelve, Judas Iscariot, 14, sought an opportunity to deliver him up. Luke uh, adds, they were to give him money. Other Gospels talk about, he, and he was a thief. So poor Judas Iscariot gets really pulverized in these documents from now on, and to some extent implied previously. Um, and of course, this is the Last Supper, very, very important. Now, again, we know the new Gospel was found in the name of Judas Iscariot, which is a... Um, considered to be a Gnostic gospel, probably found in the Nag Hammadi areas. You say, what's Nag Hammadi? That's the book. It's like Qumran. It's the place where they found these uh, books that probably were hidden away because they became banned by the church. They're called Gnostic because they have an idea of Gnosis. Gnosis is the Greek idea uh, that was developed by the Neoplatonists as supernatural knowledge, wisdom. You gain enlightenment. John, the Gospel of John, seems to have that whole introduction of that uh, kind of thinking. Again, none of it is Palestinian. None of it is Palestinian. Mm -hmm. But finding the Gospel of Judas just shows people were using these scenarios to propagate their own ideas through literature, which is normal. Hollywood scriptwriters do it all the time. <coughs> Give me the plot. I'll write a different scenario. Okay, I'll write a scenario myself. Okay, I'll write one. And that's what I mean. These things are bouncing back and forth to my mind in the second and third centuries. And you say, well, when were the Gospels finally written? I don't know when the final shape of the Gospels were. You know, um, I think an early version of Mark was found at, uh, of John was found in the uh, one monastery in Sinai. Much more, I think it's called Sinaiticus, but um, that, that isn't until the early 100s anyway, like the 120 or something like that. I don't know if there's any earlier gospel materials than that. And Justin Martyr, who was someone living in the second century, he knows a, a work called the Memoirs of the Apostles he speaks about, but he doesn't know four individual gospels. He just knows a work called the Memoirs of the Apostles. You can go through Justin Martyr, who was living in the mid, uh, I say, 100s. So, and he's living in Asia Minor. So I don't know when the Gospels came to their final form, as they bounced off back and forth. Some people have theorized different things, but I have no idea. All we know is that in the 300s, under Eusebius and Constantine, the final versions were, you know, made authoritative about the Council of Nicaea and the later Council uh, later on in the, in the 300s. Get the date of that. I'm not a great historian of the early church, but you know, and which ones were banned uh, of the circulating literature. But the Gospel of Judas, which is very Neoplatonic, um, Judas is portrayed as um, heroic in that gospel. So you know, it depends who the writer is. 
Uh, Mostly, yeah. The uh, Gospel of Judith, as opposed to the, or the Gnostic thing, that really wasn't an anti-Semitic bent one as much as... No, no, there's no anti-Semitism in that one. Too. This is, most of these are, uh, I, I know this may be, uh, we've repeated it too often, most of these are written by people who have a, a real animus. That's what I want to, uh, maybe anti-Semitism is the wrong word, either real animus. Um, the Gospel of Judas is more like supernatural uh, discussions of a Neoplatonic kind. They're not showing any particular animus that I'm aware of. I don't, I don't see a lot of it. There is some, I guess, there. It depends. I have to look at it carefully. I don't want to make a final statement about that. I'd have to look at everything and, and see what we see there, how much animus or not. Animus means a, you know, a negative feeling to it. Okay, so um, for Luca, uh, 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 Satan enters Judas, by the way, who was called the uh, called Iscariot. I have to see. Uh, I don't have my Greek in front of me. I don't want to run and find it. Is it? Uh, is it? Does the? Oh, I might as well look. Uh, what is it? Luke twenty-two three. You always have to have the Greek next to you, just so you can make sure that the translation is, I mean, the translation I'm reading here is not, uh, is not really necessarily a thought. Yeah, who his surname is Scar. It doesn't say the Scar, but I think John says at one point, the Scar. Luke just said who his surname is Scar. So that's not, uh, that's not a the there. So what's the difference? Well, the Scar, but more like the Zealot, the Sicari, and so on and so forth. Anyway, um, so now let's see. They want to uh, find him without the multitude, Luke says in 22, 5, 6. Um, yeah, because he's a popular leader. And you've got a picture of what a popular leader would look like in these times in Palestine. Uh, who's the guy that uh, helped the U.S. government go into e e Iraq, what's his name, Shalabi? Did he think he's a popular leader in Iraq among any party? <laughs> no, of course not. And um, they have to drive him around with a bodyguard like 10,000 people wherever he goes. That's more like Palestine. That's a period I hate to be, hate to be you know, too vivid about it, you guys. Anyway. You have to buy whatever from your own perspective. So this is famous, uh, finding the place for the Last Supper, <coughs> a very colorful a woman bearing a pitcher, and so on and so forth again. But he does say an interesting thing that's not paralleled in any of the Gospels in Luke 22, 18. I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of heaven shall come. So finally we get Jesus as James, no wine. No wine until the kingdom. And, and uh, that's what all the early leaders, and of course that's what the Nazarites did, that's what the Rechabites did, no wine. Now, um, again, I can't pronounce any, any judgment on that. Uh, we're getting some parallel in John according to my harmonies here. Maybe yours doesn't have it. But John does have John 13, 2. The devil, I think probably not Satan. I think it's very important to look at if it's Satan or the Diabolu. That's where the Greek comes in handy. Because Diabolu definitely is parallel to the Dead Sea Scrolls as Belial. Diabolu Belial uh, moves from uh, Hebrew into Greek in the Quran, it's Iblis. Now that's really interesting. That shows you how you get the I in Semitic languages in front of a syllable. Belial goes into Arabic or uh, so on as Iblis, the way you have Iscariot, Sikari, Iscariot, Belial, Iblis. Paul then in Corinthians speaks of Beliar. What is Christ to do with Beliar? I don't have the exact number in front of me, but I, that's clearly a mis, uh, a, either a mistransmission or something like that. There was no BLR. <coughs> anyway, uh, Judas of Simon Iscariot, 
during the supper. The devil does it to him. I don't think, I guess uh, uh, John doesn't have the material about the high priest. I don't know. You'll have to check me out. And there's a long discussion here about washing Jesus' feet. I have to skip along here. Matthew 26, 23. They're at the Passover meal, and who's ever writing this knows something about the Passover meal. That they dip things into a dish. The Jews do it to this day. They dip parsley and so on and so forth into salt water. It's supposed to symbolize this, that, or the other thing. And um, they go out, uh, um, let's see. I'm going to go back here now. Um, at that point, I guess Judas Iscariot is going to go out when Jesus knows who's going to betray him. Now this is made very much in the gospel of Judas Iscariot when they show that Jesus wants this to happen and all this sort of thing. So the gospel of Judas Iscariot looks like it knows some of the other gospel portrayals and is trying to counter them. But I'm not a, a great commentator on that at the moment, so that's just beginning to be argued over. Anyway, he dipped his hand and more about the Son of Man. And uh, delivering up is very important to look if the word is delivering up because in the Damascus document over and over again speaks and they shall be delivered up. Because they did this, that, and the other thing, they shall be delivered up. Uh, meaning to foreign armies, to God's vengeance, to things of that kind. So a similar language in the Damascus document meaning to final judgment and so on. I'm not sure the word in Greek is betrayed him. I think you'll find in the actual Greek it's always deliver he who delivered him up. Uh, again, I'd have to look if he actually says I rabbi in 25 of Matthew. Um, John again now has Satan entering him in... Um, Line 27, 13, 27, again speaks of uh, Judas of Simon Iscariot, which can mean son of, brother of, or whatever. And if it's Simon Iscariot, which I think is uh, probably just as accurate, uh, it's Simon the Zealot in the uh, Gospel lesson. Anyway, Matthew, going back to 25, swinging back, so it's hard to follow these harmonies, or concordant, whatever yours is called, synopsis. Um, uses the word rabbi, which is a very late expression. John goes on about, um, in line 29 of John 13, but uh, Jesus said to buy the things we need of, and give something to the poor. And then he went out straight away. So it's a different sort of portrayal in John there of the situation. But notice, don't forget to remember the poor in Galatians. In, uh, in, uh, they were talking to Paul. Uh, when um, Paul talks about what James told him at the visit to Jerusalem that he could go to the Gentiles, but he should not forget to remember the poor, the poor being the name of the church or the assembly of God, if you want to call it that, in Jerusalem, the Ebionites, the Ebionim, E-B-I-O-N. Okay, so they go through this meal, and again, I guess we already had it, Matthew 26, 29, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until that I drink it with you in the kingdom. That may just mean I'm not going to drink any more, uh, anything of that kind. Matthew, uh, Mark has that 14:25. But before that, then we have the communion, breaking the bread, blessing it, and so on, drinking. And in 28 of Matthew, for this is my, the, my blood of the covenant, which is shed for the many unto the remission of sins. Again, the many, or poured out for the many. Then he goes on about not drinking, and Mark sort of says the same thing. He gave to drink. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out or shed for the many. And uh, they drink. 
And Luke has this do, the doing ideology, in remembrance of me. And the cup in this manner. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Uh, okay. The cup of the new covenant in my blood. Let's look at Paul again here quickly. Uh, 1 Corinthians. Again, it's a very important letter when he's talking about that he can eat anything and stop making troubles about things, sacrificed to idols, attacking <coughs> James's instructions to overseas communities. He goes on and to talk about what he received. Luke 11, 23. The Lord Jesus took bread <coughs> on the night he was delivered up, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Luke is picking up Paul here, or vice versa. And he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you shall never proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. So whatever, whoever shall eat this, this the bread and shall drink the cup of the Lord <coughs> in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Uh, so be careful how you do this and then drink the cup in this way for he who drinks unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself not seeing through to the body of the Lord that's a threat that's a threat that you drink judgment unto yourself if you don't see the the um, allegorical play here. You don't see that you're drinking or eating the body of the Lord and his blood. That's my old friend Paul at his best. That's 1123 in Luke? No, well, that's picked up in Luke. That is 1123 in Paul. Corinthians, folks. Well, I told you, bring both. Bring, I, I assigned you in this class for that reason, so that you'd be on top of things, you know, for your benefit, not mine. I want you to be, you know, knowledgeable people. That you would have a, a, a Greek, English, uh, regular New Testament, and a harmony to make it easy for you. But the harmony isn't inadequate. It just helps you. You've got to then go for a critical pass and look at the Greek and stuff. Okay? So, yeah. Here, which came first, Paul or the Gospel of Luke? Well, I don't have an answer to that question. But I do have, and it's all part of the end of my book that I uh, talked about Thursday. In this uh, session here, that uh, you may or may not have seen that they're having in uh, room uh, USU 221, the Newport room 1232 on December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, see, we used to, we, we, December 7th meant more to us than 9-11 to you guys. December 7th has gone out the window, so has Lincoln's birthday. Things that we really held precious when we were young. Because we were in the aftermath of the Civil War and we thought the Lincoln assassination was terribly important and Lincoln's birthday deserved a holiday. It's gone in favor of some other rigmarole or President's Day or some nonsense like that. Just to undermine the real spirit of this country. Anyway, I don't want to get into those kind of gripes. <laughs> <coughs> but um, I don't celebrate all the presidents, I can assure you. I'm not an idolater. I'm not going to celebrate Nixon and Johnson and Ford and all the Carter and all the Dumbos we've had. Uh, I'm not going to speak of present people because we're the, the you know it's still out. Judgment's still out. I don't think it's fair to evaluate people until you got all the much of them evaluate them. I don't still know what to make of Bush myself, so I'm not going to say anything one way or the other. He's a strange sort of character. Um, I'm not sure he's as evil as people try to make him out to be, but he's very tenacious, which is something that. Admirable in some regard. I don't think he's a criminal. Any case, um, going back to um, this and my book, etc., that's going to be talked about on December 7th, obviously. 
that's what got me off on that tangent. <laughs> I sometimes get out on a limb and I saw myself off, but other times I, I, I actually am able to creep back and find where I was in, on the tree of this supposed sequence of lectures. Anyway, look here. Damascus in Hebrew and in Greek. Let's look at that. Now, I don't think this is coincidental. This is the cream of my book. The last arguments of my book and chapters. In the Damascus document again, all important as the history of the uh, situation uh, from the Dead Sea Scrolls perspective. Very obscure document. I spend chapters of my book going through allusions in it, like digging the well, and I have a whole chapter called the Song of the Well, and the Well of Living Waters, and things like that. Read well, I've got whole chapters analyzing the Damascus document for you people. It's not a simple thing. It can't be done in a short time. It's a very esoteric but meaningful document. So, Book of Acts, more or less, from the Qumran opposition perspective. In any case, there it speaks about, we went out to the land of Damascus, from the land of Judah, went out to the land of Damascus, to raise up the new covenant, new covenant, there it is, that's why it's called the Damascus document. To set the holy things up according to their precise specifications. To love each man, every his neighbor as himself, etc., etc., etc. It's in column six of the Damascus document. Okay, there we go. The new covenant is in both. In the land of Damascus. But the new covenant, as I over and over tried to tell you in the scrolls, the Damascus document, I don't have to keep repeating it, is to set up the holy things according to their precise specifications according to the Mosaic law, not to rip them down. To separate holy from profane. This is a group of holy ones. It's called the men of the perfection of holiness. The perfect of the way. That's how they call themselves. They're an extreme holiness group out in the wilderness practicing the all-righteousness regimen of perfection of the way. The Sermon on the Mount, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Unless your perfect uh, perfection exceeds in the scribes and the Pharisees, or your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. That kind of thing, but with a more of a bite to it than the, than the gospel. Okay? So, that new covenant is to separate holy from profane. Remember we did the book of Acts a little bit and we had the tablecloth vision where Peter learns he shall not call anything profane or any, uh, any man uh, 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 impure and he shall not separate between holy and profane. That's the direct contradiction of the Dead Sea Scrolls New Covenant in the land of Damascus. So one new covenant is very opposite of the other, and, 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 and Jesus is carrying it on here. Do this in remembrance of me. In the Damascus document, we actually have a passage concerning God-fearers at the end of, uh, of column 19, beginning of column 20. In the second manuscript, I go through all this in my book, where it says, and a book of remembrance was written out for God-fearers. God-fearers usually being a word for uh, non-Jewish uh, people who, uh, who attach themselves to the community. It's there. It's there. there. Uh, I argue there were non-Jewish people at the Dead Sea Scrolls group, but they were observing the law in the James-like manner. And I make, I show you some of the usages in the uh, and the Nilvim with them, column four, where the sons of Zadok talks about. And the Nilvim are the ones who went, out, the penitents who went out in the wilderness, and the, the and the joiners with them. Nilvim is a used word used for Christians or for non-Jews associating themselves with the Jewish community. It's the, the, the Damascus document plays off the word uh, uh, Levites in um, Ezekiel. And Levites is based on the Hebrew root L-V-Y, which means joining. 
originally by showing themselves to the temple, but the nil beam is a word Esther actually used, the book of Esther actually uses for, for Gentiles, and so does Isaiah. Isaiah 50s, 54, 55, 56 talks about the nil beam. Those are Gentiles. So, and so they're Jews and Gentiles in this, new, in this new community, but they do observe the law, and they do separate holy from profane. Okay, here we have it. And so now, dam in Hebrew means what? It doesn't mean God damn it. It means blood. And cuss, the mass cuss. Cuss in Hebrew means what? Cup. What? This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And there's no relationship between the new covenant and the land of Damascus and, and this. <coughs> but you can go further. That may just be an accident. I don't believe in accidents like that. What do the some criminal inspectors say? There's no such thing as accidents in criminal investigations or whatever. We're not in a criminal investigation. But in any case, further, in Hebrew, Damascus, that's Greek, transliterated into Hebrew and English. Damascus. But in Hebrew, Damascus is what? Damashek. Dam in Hebrew means, I'm giving you the, the cream of my book here, real New Testament code. In Hebrew, Dam is blood and Mashek, also the same root, Mashke, means Give to drink means give to drink. No, no, hey, come on. This cup, drink this in remembrance of me. Take, eat, this is the body and my blood, and so on and so forth. And he gave them to drink, and so on. I don't think that can be accidental. Those kind of plays, to my mind, are, are, are too powerful. and too vigorous to just say, it's, oh, that's just an accidental resemblance. I don't think so. I think it's Paul-type people esotericizing this Damascus idea in various ways and making a, uh, making a, a new picture. Now, maybe not. Again, this is the cup of the new uh, covenant in my blood. And this is for remission of sins. Drink this for remission of sins and so on and so forth. John taught remission of sins in the wilderness. No, Josephus said John taught that the uh, that the uh, that the soul should be purified by the practice of righteousness, which would probably uh, and the, and then come around the penitents go out in the wilderness, the penitents from sin in Jacob, as the Damascus document puts it, go out into the wilderness. So in Qumran, we have an idea of remission of sins. I think all this is compressed here into this more attractive format here. Now, that may be wrong, and uh, but I think that's, uh, uh, there's a lot there to think about. So what am I saying here? That the Damascus, the, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which we have done, drink this, and this is for remission of sins. And don't forget, uh, blood was forbidden in James's instruction to overseas community. You are forbidden to blood, uh, fornication, uh, things sacrificed to idols and strangled things or carrying. That's what's forbidden unto you. Stay away from, as he puts it. Uh, stay away from Nazarite. Lehinazer in Hebrew. Stay away from in Hebrew is Lehinazer, which is over and over again used in the, da in the Damascus document. Nazer is, uh, is the root of the word Nazarite. And the scroll people are a kind of community of lifelong Nazarites in the wilderness. And I think perhaps Jesus of Nazareth is taken from that, but maybe not. Again. Anyway, let's finish up this Last Supper here. Then we can go to the portrayal and the resurrection scenes in the last week of the class, or in the last three sections. Uh, quick here, uh, so... Um, uh, Peter is chided again. I'll just give you a few more minutes. Just give me a minute here. 22:31 in Luke. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan, so on and so forth. Uh, poor Peter is always being chastised. 
Uh, and then um, something about uh, in Luke, uh, I don't have the context here, 2236. And he that hath none, let him sell his cloak and buy a sword. And uh, he was reckoned with the transgressors, and they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. So, um, and Luke anyway, and Brandon makes a big thing of this. I'm, I'm not really, since I don't consider most of the material historical, I don't really try to see through it. But here Jesus is pictured as arming his, his, his followers. So uh, as far as the, uh, the issue of Jesus being uh, pacifistic is concerned, uh, there is that point uh, that people like to pull out of uh, these passages, people like Brandon and others. And uh, then just quickly, we have uh, the, um, the betrayal and arrest material, the agony or whatever it's called in Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 30, Luke 14, uh, Luke Mark 26 to 42. Luke uh, 22, 39, and so on, and going on. But I just want to pick up this arming thing. And uh, in Matthew 26, they lay hands on him, and Jesus stretched out his hand. That were those that were with Jesus dressed, uh, stretched out his hand and smote him with his, the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear with a sword. A certain one stands up in Matthew 14:47 and does this. Anyway, the people are fondest for this arming his his, his disciples or whatever being armed uh, are fond of pointing out these passages of they're carrying swords and things or whatever. I mean, I don't make a lot of this, frankly, but I just point it out to you for whatever it's worth concerning uh, the the, uh, the disciples and so on being armed. Okay, um, here's what we'll do. We have three sessions left. I hope to get through all this material in three sessions. And uh, we'll pick, make me pick up there uh, next time, the garden scene, okay? This took me longer than I thought, but on the other hand, the Last Supper and all that's going on there is tremendously important for seeing these connections if you're interested. You judge the historicity.